It's an honor to be here, and I'm excited to hear from our four panelists coming up. Uh, so if everyone uh, could please stand up. We have, uh, from left to right, we have uh, Sean Nicholson from uh, Clean Missouri. Uh, we have Catherine Canner from uh, Better Boundaries Utah. Uh, we have Kent Theory from uh, Fair Maps Colorado. And also Katie Fahey from Voters Not Politicians in Michigan. And also, as a special surprise, we'd like to welcome the governor himself up to participate on the panel. Uh, so I'd like to have our panelists just briefly introduce themselves and, and tell us a little bit about the uh, uh, efforts they were involved with with last year's successful ballot campaign, starting with Katie. Hi, so I'm Katie Fahey. I um, accidentally started a political movement with a Facebook post in Michigan. Um, I did not previously have any campaign experience, but had been passionate about gerrymandering um, and wrote, hey, I want to take on gerrymandering in Michigan. If you want to help, let me know, smiley face. Um, and I have decided that emojis are key to saving democracy. Because uh, <laughs> about two years earlier, I had made the si almost the same exact Facebook post and nobody even liked it. And yet this one <laughs> led to an overwhelming majority, over 2.5 million people um, voting yes to end gerrymandering in Michigan. I'm an aging corporate schmuck uh, <laughs> uh, who just had had enough. I remember my political science professor uh, back many, many years ago, in about the fifth week of class, talked about gerrymandering. And I was so sure that, that it, that, because I was raised in a small town in Wisconsin, and uh, I, I came out to California for college, I was so sure that he was lying about America that I sent a letter home to my parents wondering if I should switch schools. Uh, after another couple of weeks of class, I realized that he was, he was right uh, and that we had a problem. And then what was, uh, was an art form then has become a science uh, since then. And so in Colorado, we passed uh, open primaries two years ago uh, and, and uh, gerrymandering reform this time around, as you already know. And I think the one observation I'd make just to start off is it's one thing to have uh, an idea that's the right idea. It's another thing for it to be the, the right time. And, and I was involved here in California. Uh, back in the governor's time, I don't know if Kathy's here yet from Common Cause, but we were the co-designers of the California gerrymandering reform. When we did the focus groups back then, when we did the surveys, our biggest problem was no one had heard of it. And many people, once you explained what it is, said, well, no one should ever redraw a district line, period, according to any methodology, because that just opens up the door. Uh, and we barely won that time around. In fact, we decided that the first initiative only focused on the state elections, not the federal because we would have created so much opposition if we had gone for federal at the same time, we would have lost. Even only going for the state level, we won 50.5 to 49.5. We only did that uh, because of uh, the governor's leadership. It would not have passed otherwise. And I was involved in the co-design, but at the point that the governor decided to take this on, as part of his quest for better democracy, I had to drop out because I run a healthcare company. Our primary customer is the federal government. At that point, my company was threatened with so much retaliation in Washington, D.C. that I had to drop out and not be a part of the campaign after having spent six, seven months co-designing it. So the world is so different now. The fear in our system, the fear among our populace is, is almost palpable. And even compared to the last cycle when I ran the open primaries initiative when we won, the number of partisan Ds on the far left, partisan Rs on the far right, and everything in between that are worried about our democracy is much higher than I've ever experienced it through these last 14 years of thinking and working on stuff like this. So the, the woods are filled with kindling. Uh, it's just so important that some of us light the match. That's great. So I'm Catherine Cantor, the campaign manager for Better Boundaries from Utah. And although we didn't start Better Boundaries with an emoji and a Facebook post, um, it wasn't that far off from that. We really uh, were a, just a group of regular people, very organically grown, who came together from both sides of the aisle, which is a really important piece of the Utah story, and I can talk about that later. Um, but we were people who came together, even though we were divided in other uh, ways, came together because we were unified over this simple idea 
that voters should pick their politicians and that politicians have to be accountable to their voters and that they're not when egregious gerrymandering uh, comes into play. And so we came together, we, we pulled this initiative together really by the bootstraps. <laughs> we had to sort of organize on the fly and, and we benefited from the people who had come before us and groups around the country who were willing and able to advise us, which was extremely helpful. And we pulled together a bipartisan, multipartisan coalition of people to pass a redistricting initiative. And I think that's an important piece of the Utah story to understand that redistricting reform can happen even in one of a, a place that where it looks like it's unlikely, right? There were so many reasons not to pursue redistricting reform in Utah. Um, it's one of the hardest states in the country to get on the ballot. We obviously are a single party, majority controlled state. We have a single party trifecta, um, a super majority in the House and State Senate. Um, we're actually a statutory state, so our initiative is a statutory measure, not a constitution. I could go on and on of all the reasons not to do redistricting reform in Utah. But there was one simple reason why we should, and that's because we had to. Back to what the governor was saying, why this is not a time where we need to be sitting on the couch and saying, this is too hard. It is hard. It's hard. It's messy. But it can be done with the right team and the right resources um, and the right messaging. And I, and I hope Utah will be an example to other states similarly situated to us that there is an opportunity and potential for redistricting reform. My name is Sean Nicholson from Missouri. I live in Kansas City. Uh, what became Amendment 1 that we passed by a two to one margin in November um, actually came out of years of frustration and years of research. Uh, when we started, and we tried to get language together back in 2016, we had no idea that anyone else cared or anyone else thought about gerrymandering. We just knew that Jefferson City was messed up, that we had a whole bunch of people get reelected for reasons, like it, it, there was just no competition. People got reelected over and over again. It was a cesspool and corrupt in a lot of ways. And so we were trying to figure out, like, how can we get our state legislature back on track make it more accountable back to the people. So we filed right after the elections in 2016. We collected signatures after we launched, again, with bipartisan support, which I think is a theme that we'll be talking about. Uh, we launched with bipartisan support, collected signatures through a lot of 2017 into 2018, um, and really built a huge, amazing coalition with thousands of volunteers, um, with former politicians, former legislators who had seen how bad things were in Jefferson City and they'd had enough and said, that was gross, we should fix that. Um, and then we built support from like a crazy bunch of n unusual allies like the AARP and the League of Women Voters um, and then progressive reform groups and conservative reform groups. So it was really amazing. Um, it was really an honor to be a small part of that big fight. So I mean, it's just pretty cool to be on the stage after all we've been through and trading lessons and learning from each other. Yeah, so it was uh, good, good to hear from everyone and their experience uh, with success last year was very incredible to see. Uh, so my first question is for uh, Arnold, and it's where do you see us going from here now that we've had the success in 2018, and how do we build on that? Well, I think that we have uh, clearly had a great beginning here, even though it was a lot of struggle. And when I think back about the days that I talked about in my speech, when we talked about redistricting reform and gerrymandering, about subjects like that, people just stared at you and they just did not know what the hell you were talking about. <laughs> they have not even heard the majority of people that there are district lines that are being drawn or by whom they are drawn by, uh, what the objective is and that it's happening every 10 years and all, all this kind of stuff was kind of new. So we, of course, struggled with that, but now, there are more and more journalists now that are really articulating it really well. And so I think that uh, that's why I mentioned that now people are coming up to me and talking to me about redistricting reform and in a very, very articulate way and they talk about, oh, this is really great, congratulations, you have four more states that, that won uh, you know, the redistricting reform. So people are much more up to date today. So I think that there is a certain momentum that is uh, growing and I think it was really terrific to have those four states win and to have so many different people that got involved in that, people that maybe have never been involved in the political issues before, but they just raised up and uh, they just said, you know, enough is enough. We're gonna do something about it. And I think that the key thing of this event here today is 
to motivate other states, to let them know that after 2020, the lines will be drawn again. So it is up to you who should draw those lines. I mean, there's four states here and other states like Arizona and, and Ohio and California have already made the decision that we are not gonna have politicians draw the district lines. So we want to make sure that the day is an event here where we inspire other states someone from those states that come up and they say, we're going to lead this, I'm going to lead this, and I'm going to build a team, and that we are going to win. Because in 2020, if we get states like Florida, let's say, or Pennsylvania, big states like that, Texas or New York, I mean, then we will have more than half, or if not two-thirds of the congressional districts on our side, and that will be drawn by outside commissions. So this is why it is very important that people now start forming those committees and we inspire them. And this is why we wanted to put this kind of digital handbook together where people can go online and really see how it is done. It's no different than when I was a young bodybuilder. I did not know how to do a curl or how to do a bench press or an incline press or a deadlift or a bend over rowing or any of those things. I copied it from bodybuilding magazines. So I copied the exercises and that's how I built myself up to become a world champion and then eventually I created my own routine. And I think I want people to have the same ability to just look at something and say, oh, that's how they did it. Now we all know that every state is different, the laws are different in orders, but I think that this uh, guide, this digital handbook, um, this incubator that we're creating here today I think it's going to be really a great guideline for you to know how to go forward if it is the financing and the, the raising money and uh, how to draw the initiative, how to write it, where do you get a lawyer from and all those kind of things. So there's a lot of things that we, where we don't have to redesign the wheel and where there's help up to, out there. And uh, we are more than happy to help you in every way possible, including myself coming to your state and campaigning for the initiative. Um, because I see this as kind of like, this is something that, you know, I always fall into this kind of things that are very hard to explain to people. I don't know why. But it's like I said, in the beginning, bodybuilding was very hard to explain to anybody. And then environmental issues, you know, how hard is it to explain to people, you know, global warming, what is it, why is it called global warming, all that stuff. It's so complicated, and this district is just one more of those very complicated issues. Uh, but. They're very important issues, you know, and so to me, I, I'm totally committed to this. Uh, the Schwarzenegger Institute here at USC is totally committed to help in every way possible to make you, if you decide to run with your state and to put that campaign together, to help you win. And I think it will be very important that we win a few more states in 2020. We have a great opportunity there, the momentum is on our way because as you could see in Washington, nothing is getting done, nothing. I mean, what have you heard? Now they, they close the government, there's no funding. They're talking about a wall versus no wall. Now how stupid of a dialogue is that? Think about it, no one talks about comprehensive immigration reform, which is what this country needed for the last three, four decades. Comprehensive immigration reform, no one talks about that. It's only the wall versus no wall. Well, how did they get away with this crap? Only because they get reelected. It doesn't matter. Like I said, the approval rating is 18%. Now, that may I remind you, if you go and ask people, that's below the approval rating of herpes. <laughs> and of Fidel Castro and people like that, and things like that. This is terrible. but. 98% get re-elected. So we got to stop that. Because when we stop that, and we make the legislators accountable, the lawmakers accountable, there will be action in Washington. Until that time, there will be no action. It will continue on just like it has. So this is why I'm involved, and this is why I continue being involved until I'm six feet down there. I'm gonna fight for that all the way. So I'd like to ask the other panelists, since you did run these successful campaigns last year, what are some of the lessons that you learned uh, 
by being involved in this process that you'd like to share with others who are seeking to emulate and uh, you know, run their own successful campaigns in other states going forward? So I would, so we mentioned the bipartisan piece. I think um, one of the lessons from our Missouri experience was talk to anyone who will listen and start early and have those conversations to win over support. Um, I remember having phone calls as people were driving to and from the Capitol or I'd go drive and we'd have lunch over and over again um, to try and earn the support from some non-traditional allies. And what mattered was A, that we were willing to take the time to earn their support and that when they had questions and we went line by line to the policy, we could be real and say, you know, the catch is there is no catch. Like this is open, this is transparent, this has been vetted, this has been um, uh, reviewed by people who think about this all the time because these are long, long fights. And it's very easy to get, a, it's much easier to get a no vote than a yes vote when it comes to issue positions. So you gotta be able to show your cards because you're gonna be talking about it for a long, long time. And um, it was great that we didn't have anything to hide and we weren't, um, th that was really important. So for us, it was really important, since again, we were this multi-partisan initiative, to make sure that the conversation didn't completely get sucked into a partisan battle narrative. And that's not easy to do because obviously gerrymandering has a partisan aspect to it and that's one of the reasons people gerrymandering. But there's also a whole other incentive, which is just incumbent retention, right? These are people who are drawing these districts in order to create safe seats for themselves so that they can win in uh, the next election. Um, and that can result in uh, the divvying up of, of communities, right, cities and towns. And those are the things that we found people were really bothered by, this notion that you've got conflicted individuals drawing their own maps and considering them their districts, not the people's districts, right? And this idea that communities were being sliced and diced for reasons that were benefiting politicians, not individuals. And that was a much more effective way to talk about why you needed redistricting reform than getting sucked into that partisan debate. I'll also suggest that for anybody who's considering to do one of these campaigns, um, try to find a mascot. Uh, our mascot ended up being Ronald Reagan, which was um, a really, really effective message because what we needed to do in Utah, since we are a Republican-oriented state, we needed to make sure that Republicans knew it was okay to be anti-gerrymandering, right? Um, and so we needed a symbol of that. And so we used Ronald Reagan's image and, and phrases that he had said over and over again, like gerrymandering's a national disgrace. That idea, image with those words, was a way to sort of trigger in people's minds, it's okay to be for redistricting reform. And so that was, um, I think, a really important piece. Yeah, it's so hard not to be generic in this kind of stuff, but I'll take a stab and talk about uh, Noah's Ark going upstream and consequences. Uh, Noah's Ark is, I think, just uh, another way of putting the theme that's already been talked about. From day one, we very much insisted on, on always having a D and R and an I and, and wanting to grow the uh, list of, of activists that were in favor on a very, very symmetrical basis. Uh, we also engaged in hundreds of hours of shared excruciating negotiation so there'd be a deep level of shared ownership and also you would see that the other side actually isn't as nefarious as you probably suspected. So, uh, so first this notion of Noah's Ark from the very beginning. It's not a democratic thing where you're inviting Republicans. It's not a Republican thing where you're inviting Democrats. Uh, the, the Noah's Ark principle is so, so important to building this sense of momentum. The second concept is upstream that it, it, it is very good and if you can provoke an incredible grassroots movement, you know, that's obviously of huge value. Uh, I would argue it's equal, of equal importance to go upstream and what you wanna go is to the biggest partisan funders uh, on each side and the most important uh, organizations that endorse, whether that's the firefighters or the dairy farmers or the NAACP, because again, Americans in general are worried on this topic. And by going upstream and getting some of the intensely partisan Ds to, to come on board and write checks, some of the intensely partisan and known Rs, some of the classic funders of aggressive electoral campaigns in each area, as well as some of the most respected Is, it changes the conversation. Because you have X percent of the, of the players in terms of upstream funding and endorsements that are, that are locked and loaded on this issue, they're not gonna come your way. 
There's some that are going to come right away, but there's this huge group in the middle that if you create the, the right momentum by having some of the other peer funders take a stand and say, yes, you know, I'm one of the most fervent Republicans in this state, but I'm worried about America's democracy, and I'm, that suddenly that changes the conversation for the rest. So I think some do-good organizations start too much with talking to people like them, and I say the opposite. Go to some of the most intense partisans. You're going to get rejected more often than you're going to get accepted. But then once you get one or two acceptance from those players, it changes the dialogue with everyone else. And those people are out there. Uh, you just have to be prepared for rejection. The last thing is consequences, which because we did so well in building a coalition of classic partisans, intense partisans, rich partisans, big organizations that normally endorse one party or the other, because we had them, we never had to do this, but what we were prepared to do was show consequences. I mean, this is a real campaign. This is like getting elected. It's a full contact sport. It's not a civics lesson where you're gonna go out and give good speeches and win the election. That can happen, that's not enough. And so we wanted to be sure that certain people in the legislature knew that an overwhelming percentage of their people in their district were in favor of this. And that we would make sure that a very high percentage of them knew that they opposed it if in fact they did that you're going to have to take a stand, we're going to make your stand public, uh, other, and, and, and you're going to, and in many districts, take some serious demerits by being on the other side of this. Just like in a campaign, you argue why you're, uh, why you're better than your opponent, so you want to be ethical, you want to be honest, but we very much put in place, we're prepared to put in place, we ended up not having to do much of it, unlike open primaries two years earlier, where we ended up running very aggressive ads against a couple Ds and a couple Rs, because we wanted their their, uh, their uh, constituents to know that they were not in favor of opening up primaries. And that changed the conversation immensely. Good old fashioned, ethical, legal, straightforward, above board, factual politics. So for us, Noah's Ark, consequences and upstream, I think were three of the principles that led us to have this incredible momentum. Uh, our legislature, for example, which six months earlier would have voted against it, ended up going 100% in favor of both, both chambers uh, because it was so clear that we had mobilized a coalition and they were gonna face consequences if they opposed the will of the people. There's so many um, great lessons that we learned and happy. We have lots of people who'd love to talk to you about it. Our organization was actually able to mobilize over 14,000 volunteers across our state for almost two years. There were thousands of people who pretty much put their lives on hold to try and end gerrymandering. And that's related to the advice I would pass on. Now this might sound kind of common sense, but nobody is happy with the state of politics. Nobody. So trust people. Like trust other voters in your state to be intelligent enough to understand that once they hear about gerrymandering, they can see that it's probably leading to some of that unhappiness. Um, we, for, you know, pretty much like a year and a half of the campaign were citizen funded, citizen led. We were taking everybody's professional skills that they had in their day jobs and applying them to how to craft a campaign. And it was hundreds of thousands of conversations on the street. We had clipboards with the pictures of the congressional districts on the back, just starting with, are you happy with the state of politics? And big shocker, nobody is. So you end up having these conversations with people who in all parts of the state, rural, urban, Democrat, Republican, independent, even extremely apathetic voters um, that I think would end up surprising you. Uh, it was very funny when we were gathering petitions, one of the people that I went up to, um, I said, you know, are you registered to vote? And he goes, no, you know, the system's all corrupt. There's stuff like gerrymandering. And I was like, oh, darn, I really <laughs> wish you were registered because we're trying to end that. And he actually got all of his friends to sign it and promised me he would uh, end up uh, registering to vote so he could vote for this if it got on the ballot. But I really think that average people are very much discounted a lot. We don't put a lot of faith in other people. We often think we're the smartest person in the room or you need the experts and it's just not the case. Fairness, transparency, wanting a better world, a better state, that is something that a lot of us have in common. And I would just take, you know, this is one of those really beautiful issues where you can go and say, you know, this has been happening for 200 years. Democrats do it, Republicans do it, and like, we the people are the only ones who can fix it. Going back to what Andrew was talking about with the, the conflict of interest piece, you know, politicians are not gonna give themselves less power. 
So it is up to us, it is up to people. And our experience in Michigan was just that the people ultimately were the ones who were the champions because they're the voters. It makes sense, but again, I think sometimes you get so in campaign mode that you forget how much you really can um, rely, on, really, rely on your fellow citizens. Yeah, so one thing all four of your states had in common, uh, despite having very different election laws, is they all allowed ballot initiatives. Uh, and so a lot of the reforms we've seen, uh, with California being one of the most prominent examples, was these ballot initiatives that just totally sidestepped incumbent politicians, but did bring together people. So uh, can you all talk a little bit about you know, what it took to get on the ballot and you know, what uh, people could take away from that for other states like Florida that have the initiative process? Sure, I can um, start. We actually uh, were evaluating, you know, we could have gone the lawsuit route, mm -hmm. uh, we could have tried to work with the legislature, but there had been 10 different bills introduced and never even voted on, um, so we didn't think that was a good route. Um, we really wanted to change who was drawing the lines. That's actually where we got our name. We wanted voters, not politicians, drawing these lines. In Michigan, um, you have to get 10% of registered voters who voted in the previous gubernatorial election to sign a petition by county in 180 days. So what that meant for us is we needed 315,654 registered Michigan voters signatures designated by county in 180 days. Um, very overwhelming. It really often isn't done in our state uh, unless you have a lot of paid signature gatherers. Uh, one of the unfortunate things is that bill actually just got harder. Our legislature during lame duck session just gave us a great treat to the people of Michigan by making it even harder to get onto the ballot, which is very unfortunate, but I think we scared them. That's how I'll take that. Um, we actually ended up gathering over 425,000 signatures in 110 days with all volunteers, almost 4,000 people standing at rest stops. Um, we mapped out and talked to <laughs> all the people who cleaned the rest stops and saw which ones are the most busy and like uh, uh, the day before Thanksgiving and on Thanksgiving, we had thousands of people waiting for people to come there, football games, um, uh, and anything you could think of. Um, and then uh, once you do that, you just have to verify those signatures. We were able to get onto the ballot. But in Michigan, one of the interesting things, and we knew this going into it, is there isn't really a check and balance to make sure that your law was written correctly. Um, you can kind of work with the Secretary of State, but they make it very clear that they are not giving an official legal opinion. And so we actually, uh, our opposition, used a strategy of trying to get us thrown out in the Michigan Supreme Court. We have an extremely partisan Supreme Court uh, that has been vindictive in the past based on partisan lines. Uh, but we had used a lot of lawyers and felt very confident in our bill and ultimately won that Supreme Court challenge. But the hard part about that too was that we were already a year and a half into the campaign. We had well, overwhelmingly gathered enough signatures, but we still weren't getting that, like, you're officially on the ballot until um, August of 2018, which doesn't give you a lot of time to then finally be able to focus on just getting people to vote yes. I, I think our approach was quite generic, so it won't be anything uh, that useful in stepping through it. We raised the money, we hired the firms, we got it done. I would just emphasize one thing that like Katie said, which is the importance of hiring superb, experienced legal counsel on a timely basis, and so that everything you do uh, is invulnerable to attack, uh, most particularly uh, the, the statutory and constitutional issues raised by some of these things. Um, so just doing that on a timely basis and investing, again, the right kind of professional resources and experienced resources to work on uh, the drafting, uh, not only of your initiative, but of the ballot language and influencing that language, influencing the blue book or whatever kind of information packets are sent out so that when you write your initiative, it's not only done from a, uh, from a mecha mechanical point of view to work, it's also looked at uh, through an intense legal filter and also through uh, a, a marketing and uh, ballot language approval uh, filter. Yeah, um, before I get to signature gathering, I want to reemphasize that. Um, when someone tells you you're spending too much time in drafting the law, ignore them because you should spend as much time as you think you should and then spend more because here's the thing, it doesn't matter what kind of grassroots movement you have if you don't have good law and good policy in that, in that uh, what you're submitting to the, to the voters, you're not gonna accomplish your end goal, right? So that is one of the most important things and it's hard to know that because you wanna get in the field quickly but I'm telling you it's all about the law. Um, okay, on signature gathering. 
Similar to Michigan, uh, Utah is a state where uh, getting on the ballot is not for the weak of heart. It's extremely hard, um, both because of the number of signatures you need, 10% of people who voted in the last presidential election, but more importantly, you have to get them in 26 out of the 29 Senate districts, which is essentially our counties. So you have to go to far-flung places in the state where population is not, you know, you don't have densely populated areas, and it's very hard. Um, it's one of the reasons that Utah has not had a history of ballot initiatives. We've had four initiatives pass in the history of our state, so 100 plus years, so we're not California, we're not an initiative state. Um, and I think it's because people in the past thought it was prohibitively expensive or you couldn't uh, mass the grassroots volunteer efforts to do it. Um, this year, obviously things changed. We had um, three initiative actually pass, including Prop 4. Um, four initiatives got on the ballot but if the signature gathering requirements was, weren't hard enough, we also have this um, rescission process, which means that 30 days after the initiatives submit all their signatures, people have the opportunity to rescind their signature, and there's nothing that the initiatives can do. You can't supplement a signature that's been rescinded after that. Um, and it, get, it provides an opportunity for opposition groups to come in and pick off signatures by going to people who they know signed and convince them to rescind their signatures. So it's another onerous um, uh, method of getting, of getting issues not on the ballot. And that actually happened with one of the groups. So there were four that qualified and one that dropped off. Um, so it's a very, very hard process. Having said that, I recommend everyone pursue it. <laughs> <laughs> so signature gathering is a grind and it, it's hard, but my pitch for why it why you should do it and why you should think about it is that it helps build long-term power and skills and organizations that last way beyond a discrete campaign. So like I've seen organizations before and after a signature gathering drive, and it's very simple. You get a signature and you gotta follow the rules and you check the boxes, but you can measure it. Like every day we got this amount and our goal was this and we did it or we didn't hit our goal. And then you can see over time, like these are leaders that they hit their goals and they grow. So. Like there's power that can be built for organizations and leaders beyond that discrete moment. And so in those 25, 30 states where you can do um, initiatives, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty great tool. Well, anyway, I just want to say uh, we were not as fortunate in California that uh, we won the first round. Uh, so we tried many times. I think, if I'm not mistaken, with four times or five times it failed. And... Um, and even, you know, I myself tried it in 2005 and uh, it failed and then we came back again. And, uh, you know, there's all kinds of excuses they will use. I mean, uh, and I was very fortunate that we uh, got a lot of help from Common Cause because uh, the, the Democrats made it so look like this is typical Schwarzenegger. It's a power grab. It's a Republican power grab and all this kind of stuff. They were kind of spreading and so people said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. And, uh, and they convinced them and we lost and then we came back again. And then eventually, I think, if I'm not mistaken, we made it part of a tax deal, right? Where they put it on a ballot. Uh, no? Because we got it, we got, oh, we gathered the signatures. Okay, we got it, oh yeah, okay, the, so the, in, okay, yeah, exactly. In Ohio, the legislators passed it and then they put it on a ballot. But uh, anyway, so with us it was a fight and it was a fight over and over again. And it was, uh, you know, Democrats and Republicans were in on the whole thing, and they divided up the pot. And I knew right away when two people that hated each other, which was the Republican uh, Senate majority, uh, minority leader and the Democratic um, President Pro Tem, uh, were fighting in my office all the time and cursing and spitting at each other and the chairs were flying and everything. And then if literally like two hours later, three hours later, they would call me from a bar and they said, Governor, I'm sitting here with my very dear friend. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, how could it be in the two hours later, your dear friend, when you guys were just you know, screaming at each other? No, 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 we, we get along really well. And we want to talk to you about something very important that we both totally agree on. Get away from this redistricting reform. Don't endorse it because it's bad news. It's paid for the Democrats, it's paid for the Republicans, don't get involved. So that's when I knew that we were on to something really good. And uh, they were fighting tooth and nail, and then eventually we were smart enough to just do the state legislative seats, the drawing of the district lines, and then the congressional seats later on. 
But I tell you something, that the, the amount of money that came from a national level, I remember like, you know, Nancy Pelosi immediately had someone donate $4 million against us. And uh, I mean, they, these guys came in with big, big money and they took us out. Even though we had $10 million ready to go with the campaign, we thought there was enough money, but they came up with $20 million, you know, so that, that's just the way it was. Uh, but like I said, if you, uh, the press asked me uh, after we lost the fifth time, they asked me, says, don't you get the message, Governor, that the people just don't want to have redistricting reform? And I said, no, I don't get that message. I said, you know, I come from the athletic background. I said, and in sports, you try something over and over until you get it. I said, I remember failing in my bench press of the 500 pounds 10 times. But it didn't mean that I should just throw it all away and just walk away from this whole thing. I said, I tried it the 11th time. And the 11th time at the German championships in powerlifting, I did the 500 pounds. I said, so you never, ever give up. And the same thing was with this. We never gave up. And we came back again and came back, and then eventually we won. And I tell you that the key thing that I want to say is that I learned is I'm involved with a lot of charitable organizations, you know, with the environmental organization and the after school programs and all this. You can have the best ideas in the world, but if you don't have the money, you don't have anything. And this is why it is very important as you create this team and as you come up with this idea to really start looking for that money because you will go and need to go on TV and have TV spots as we have just seen before, and you have to pay for that. So money is really the thing that, that is extremely important. So you gotta get the big players involved, and you gotta communicate really well of why this is absolutely crucial and important, because the communication, if you do it half-ass, and you talk to a person, that person will not then be able to be a salesman for you now to go out and to tell 10 other people. If, if you don't explain it well, then they will not be able to explain it well. So this is why I think what you heard here is, is you really got to articulate why this is important, explain to people how the legislators and how the lawmakers draw the district lines and why they're picking the voters rather than the voters picking them. And why do they do that? Because they get locked into the district and they have no competition. They can do whatever they want and they get reelected over and over by a huge majority. Some people look at 80%, they get 80% of the votes. And even though with no performance. And so you got to explain that to people because now I think it's the best time because there's so much chaos nationally. I think this message is easy to get across to people, to explain to people that this is the only way out by really doing redistricting reform and getting rid of gerrymandering. So I think that we have a great momentum going. So communication is key, raising money is key, and putting us a great, great team together is key. Yeah, so I'd like to ask one more question and then kick it to a Q&A. Uh, and uh, so it might be easy to think, you know, after these ballot measures have passed or after the legislators have passed a reform that, you know, the fight is over and that we've won, but, you know, we've learned in state after state that that's not true. Uh, you know, in Missouri, legislators are talking about altering the Clean Missouri Initiative. Uh, in Utah, that measure is only statutory and could theoretically be repealed. In California, Democrats put another referendum on the ballot after the legislative reform passed and uh, voters had to reject it. So what are the types of things that we should try to be doing uh, to protect these reforms and, and convince legislators to, that, you know, hey, these are, are good reforms that are good for democracy and we need to keep them? Um, yeah, so we just went through a crazy lame duck session and we were actually successful in defeating a bill that was trying to undermine our commission, thankfully. Um, but that meant keeping that army of very passionate people who had just devoted two years of their life trying to pass this active and informed and letting them know that this wasn't ending. Um, the really kind of beautiful part of that though is that especially if you're going from uh, a place where only a couple politicians are going behind closed doors once every 10 years, and then you're having a really transparent, high public participation policy, like ours is, for the very first time, like nine million people in Michigan have the opportunity to actually be in the room where it happens and participate in this if they want to. And so talking about that, even throughout the campaign when we were trying to build a coalition of other groups and just talking about the intention we wanted to have and keeping this uh, 
a, a movement. You know, you can pass the reform, but if nobody's showing up to those public hearings or paying attention to the transparency aspects that you've put into your policy, you did it for nothing. Um, the whole point is that now citizens can actually see why this is happening. They can apply to be on the commission. Um, and we wanted to make that like an exciting thing. I kept thinking about the fifth graders who'd be learning about gerrymandering and how in Michigan that no longer was a thing because millions of voters had decided to say yes and actually when they turn 18 they can apply to be a commissioner which I think is cool um, and so I think that a really big part of a, a strategy around just keeping people motivated is, is constantly keeping that in the back of people's minds of we are changing this so that we can have a system that we can all participate in um, unfortunately in Michigan they then went after the petition process we expect that um, you know, they'll try and undermine uh, how to go into the application process or how to show up to the public hearings and um, misrepresent themselves. But those were all things that thankfully we had learned from other states who had passed this reform before us, like California. Um, and we had been really intentional in the policy creation to try and uh, put as many safeguards as we could, but certainly don't think we thought of everything. So a big part of your plan for implementation, if you do pass this, has to be having watchdogs. I think we are fully owning the responsibility of being the watchdogs who are gonna show up to every meeting and keep talking about, hey, here are the ways, we're not gonna shy away from them, here are the ways that you know maybe they'll be influenced, but let's watch it, and for the first time ever, we'll actually all be able to participate in this process instead of being kept out of it. And before I answer that, I'm just going to go backwards for one second and emphasize something the governor said about the, the importance of fundraising. And it's also important to start that early. And now with Kathy from Common Cause is here. When we were working that in the non-sexy phase where you're doing the, the, the tens and tens of hours going over the architecture and having legal review and doing the focus groups and surveys, that that's where a lot of these things die because you actually have to spend a lot more money than you might think. And when we were working together, Common Cause had the the brand name, had the domain expertise, had a lot of the field presence. I was fortunate enough to be able to write a bunch of the checks to, to, to get all that work done in a very, very professional way before it was a real thing that begins to attract other money. So getting the right funding early on and trying to get some significant commitments early in the journey is a big deal. Otherwise, you're cramming too much last minute work in right before you have to start getting signatures. You miss something and then you're subject to legal appeal. So getting the money early is a, a big deal. Uh, and then to the other question, I think uh, just I mean, is a, uh, begin with the end in mind. Know that there is a fifth quarter to the game. Uh, and, uh, and for example, when we passed open primaries one cycle earlier, uh, they tried to mess around with it in the legislature in terms of rulemaking and implementation. And that's when we went on, on the air with, uh, with factual negative ads with respect to some of those leaders who were doing it, playing their classic sport against them, and that stopped a bunch of the shenanigans. But we were ready for it, we were watching for it, we had people in the meetings, and so, so just know in the operating planning that this is an ongoing responsibility, because if they know you're watching, and if they know you're gonna publicize, the odds that they even try it go down, not to zero. So Katie and um, Kent just uh, articulated this quite well. I don't know I have a lot to add to it other than when I try to describe what people might be facing when they're pursuing an initiative like this, I try to describe it as, as a phased process, right? There's multiple phases. Right now we're in phase three. Phase three is the defense mode of protecting the law. Phase one was signature gathering. Phase two was persuasion campaign. There's going to be a phase four, which is going to be actually making sure the implementation is done effectively and, and per the law, right? And so if you can think of it you, yourself, as the, as the campaign, but also your supporters, your funders in particular, um, who need to understand that we got to get through this phase. It's going to seem like it's going to be the toughest phase of all, but I'm telling you, the next one's going to be just as hard. If you can orientate yourself um, into that kind of frame of mind, um, it'll, it'll obviously serve you in the, in the long haul, which is what it is. So Michigan won their defense fight. Utah and Missouri were up next. Our legislature just reconvened yesterday. Um, the good news, the thing that gives me hope, is that um, transparency, fairness, competition, those, that's the status quo now, right? Like, we won that fight, and so the people who want to roll it back are going to have to explain why we want to go back to an unfair system or, like, backroom deals, things like that. So it's going to be a long fight this year and next, but um, I'm optimistic, and we don't have to get the band back together because uh, it never fell apart. And, and uh, now I'd like to turn it over to the audience uh, if people have questions for the panelists. 
I'm David Holtzman, I'm a former president of the League of Women Voters of Los Angeles. My question is mainly for uh, Professor Governor Schwarzenegger. Um, you live in Los Angeles. I just heard you say I'm totally committed to this. And then I also just heard the gentleman from uh, Colorado, uh, Kent Thierry, say that uh, we should go upstream and get the money early. Um, and I'm just thinking that because you live in the city of Los Angeles and the Los Angeles School District, both of which elect their uh, legislative bodies from districts, um, it would be great if the city of Los Angeles School District decided to contract with an institute like this to administer the process of running an independent commissions to draw the municipal districts. So, um, and the LA, you know, it's a huge city, there's a lot at stake, and we do set examples for the rest of the world. So, um, my questions have to do with uh, how to get the funding for it. Um, first, you'd have to get funding to put an initiative on the ballot to require the commissions, and then you'd actually have to uh, have the city spend money to administer the process. So, here I am asking upstream, um, how much do you think that would cost? And you know, how, what percentage of that do you think you'd be willing to fund with your own personal wealth? And, and again, I ask this because you say I'm totally committed to this. Well, I'll let the governor go first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> go for it. Oh. No, I, I cut the questions for the governor. No, I, I just want to say this. Yeah. Yeah. I like your style. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> to come here and to do right away the beginning of a fundraising. It is, it is cool. Uh, uh, he gave me the idea. <laughs> but I, I, I think that uh, my team has heard you, and we're going to get into it and work with you on that. Okay, so we should explore some of the ideas that you just you'll, had. You'll work with the League of Los Angeles? Absolutely, League of Women yeah. Okay. Remember not president are, anymore, but want, we'll reach out to you. you Do you have you, any idea? <laughs> the League of Women Voters have been very, very helpful. Thank you. I always say that there's nothing we accomplish by ourselves. That's why I always say, don't ever call me a self-made man. There you go. I'm a product of a lot, a lot of help. And I think when it comes to uh, you know, winning the redistricting reform, the League of Women Voters, if it's the AARP or if it is Common Cause, without those teams, I would not have been able to be successful. So I always want to tell them and them, uh, you know, how thankful I am to your organizations. And I also want to say that how proud I am of our uh, committee, the redistricting committee in California. Mm -hmm. This is a in totally independent committee. And they're doing such a fantastic job that they have to become the model of the entire nation. And so if anyone has any questions about how to come up with a great committee like that, I mean, we really have come up with the most extraordinary committee, and I think that we look back now, they've done their job so well that everyone is looking at them exactly with great admiration. So I want to say some of the members are here today. I want to say thank you, all of you. Why don't you get up for a second? Uh, uh, our commission, independent commission here. Give them a big hand here. Thank you very much for the great work. Uh, so anyway, so this is, uh, so we will get back to you on that, okay? Thank you, but sir. I, but I, I, won't, I won't try to shy away uh, from it, uh, separate from the historical contributions. One thing Kathy and I in the group debated 12 years ago was just, you know, how many people will apply? And it's just so heartwarming about America, how many people here and elsewhere do. Uh, but as, as to personal commitment, just, just so you know, my wife and I are now somewhere like $5 million into this in Colorado. Uh, over the two election cycles. And what we try to do with other people that have been fortunate enough to have that kind of ability to contribute is make them be a, a, as proud as, as creating a, a new wing of an art museum or a hospital that, and, and we wish you could put your name on helping protect America's democracy. Uh, and so we think that the, the untapped philanthropic inclination to do this can be multiplied in America many fold over the next decade if, if the rest of us light that match. Uh, because uh, my, my wife and I feel like we're doing our part. Well, thank you. I, I know the question wasn't geared towards me, but I'm going to hop in, too. Um, <laughs> just because our model was really different. We actually didn't have money until, like, the last, like, 60, 90 days, and 
We had over 14,000 individual small dollar donors that raised about over two million. Our campaign ended up needing around 16 million. So we definitely needed those large donations, but one of the myth, myths that I think I kept hearing all the time when we were getting started was like, oh, you just have to do this and then money comes. You just have to do this and then money comes. And I was like, you know, at a certain point you just realize, no, like, like we've got to prove to everybody that we are real. And at the end of the day, like we're in this to make sure that we move the issue forward. So in Michigan, we had the people who were self-funding it. It was pretty cool too. We got to do a Ask Me Anything on Reddit. Um, the governor actually hopped in for a second. But we then got national contributions, small dollars again, 100 bucks there, 20 bucks there. But crowdsourcing and the ability to get going, it adds buy-in. It makes people also be committed, stay following what you're doing. And, and I just wouldn't discount it um, because you definitely need large money. But don't wait for a really big check to think that you have to get started because sometimes you really do have to prove that there is enough excitement and you're not the only one who feels this way. Especially if you think Think about needing a popular vote in order to pass it. You know, you need that many people anyway, so you really want to make sure you're creating something that people want. Hi, my name is Acacia. I'm a student at USC. Um, so I know all of you are very focused on independent commissions, but do you believe that technology has a role to play in ending gerrymandering? Like, do you think there's a way that we can generate a computer program that can redraw districts that are nonpartisan? Um, I'll, go, I'll go first. Um, so in the Missouri plan. So independence and adding more independence to, we had an existing commission process, but it was dominated by political appointees. Um, the second, and in my mind, more important part are the criteria that are math-based and explicit to protect uh, voters. And so that was actually how we were able to build the support, is by showing through the math, and through, through, the, through these criteria, that's how we're going to guarantee that everyone's going to get a fair shake. So whether you're a Republican and you're concerned about, you know, is this some sort of democratic power grab? You're um, a democratic voter and you're worried about like, how do we um, make sure that we get a fair shake? Like it's the math um, and it's those criteria that are gonna protect everyone. So those were both very key parts of, of our proposal. So I think there's a potential for that happening in the future, um, you know, as technology uh, increases. Uh, right now, I don't think we're quite there yet. Plus, I also think you can't forget about the human element of this uh, process, right? Which let me give you an example of that. One of the most important things for anybody who's drawing these lines, being an independent commissioner or otherwise, needs to do is to go out to the community and actually talk to people about what they think. Because you will end up finding um, ideas of like communities of interest that should be kept together for some particular reason. And it would be hard for a com computer algorithm to figure that out, right? It, re it requires this like one-on-one -on -one very personal conversation and listening to the community and having the community actually have an input on how these maps are drawn. So as great as it would be to be able to have like a truly impartial group uh, of a computer, right, an impartial computer of doing it, um, just so you could take out all the partisan aspects of it. Um, I, I do think you still need that human element, certainly, certainly now and probably in the future. Yeah, I would go off of that too, that um, I think there's, technology plays such a key role for letting people participate and also you can put in different uh, political theories that help make sure that you are getting accurate representation. But when you think about like, what is representative democracy? Um, and then you're also thinking about, okay, and we're gonna amend the constitution, which is gonna like write the rules for how you draw these lines for decades to come. That's one thing we tried to really be considerate of because how we might define representative democracy today could be really different than the people of Michigan in 30 years. And so we wanted a little bit of flexibility within that so that, you know, in case people no longer really thought that the city boundaries were the right thing, they could go after like an industry boundary of like, you know, here's where all the furniture manufacturers are, whatever. So I think that when you look at the criteria and then you think about the concept of representative democracy, what does that mean? That's why you need a mix. But I think technology is like so the way that we can hopefully restore faith in people's ability to trust a system again, because that's the really unfortunate thing. We have such cynicism when it comes to politics and systems and institutions, and hopefully like, by being able to make it more accessible and have like, some data behind it, people can see that this process can work while also taking into account public participation. I ran for the Dallas City Council in 1991, <clears throat> and it was a historic election because the city was going from at-large districts to single-member districts, 
and it was a map drawn by the judges. There was maps that were voted on by the public, but the judge didn't like that, Barefoot Sanders. And in 1992, I was nominated by the Republican Party, even though I lost for the city council, and I ran again in a redistricted map. And the issue there, though, was that the redistricting and all the gerrymandering was done to create minority districts. Edie Bernice Johnson drove her own district, and she's been there ever since in the U.S. Uh, Congress. So one of the challenges that even happened here in California is the fact that you have to address the Voting Rights Act, which is that minority representation cannot be uh, diluted. Uh, how do you address that in these districts? Because when you do draw fair districts, uh, it does sometimes, you know, uh, remove the opportunity for some of the minority communities because they are having to be gerrymandered to try to pack together a minority community. So how do you address that to make sure that minority representation does not get diluted in the effort to try to increase, uh, you know, true representation of the entire state uh, versus just this one, you know, small, you know, political agenda that they have. And it's a very important political agenda, but it does drive a lot of the gerrymandering, particularly in urban states like in New York or California or Texas, where you have these huge mega cities like a Dallas and a Houston and an Atlanta. So. Well, let me just tell you that if you talk to our commissioners, they can tell you how to do it. <laughs> because uh, they have done an extraordinary job, but they put all of this into the equation. All of this stuff was very important to us. And they have done an extraordinary job, a flawless job. So if any questions as of how, to, how did they do it, you can get in touch with them and just talk to them about how they did it because they're the best. And I would say, you know, in Michigan, we have the 14th Congressional District. It looks super crazy. I know there's a necklace of it somewhere that we're hearing about later. Um, but uh, it was so often pointed to by our opposition about like, oh, see, this is why there's gerrymandering because of the Voting Rights Act. And a majority minority district does not mean that that candidate needs to win by 80% every single time. A majority is 51%, not 80%. So overpacking of minorities to dilute their vote is actually uh, something that happens quite often and I think makes the Voting Rights Act have a bad name when it comes to that and, and being able to protect uh, minority populations and being able to elect somebody. And hopefully with better systems where the criteria isn't being based on one political party trying to screw over the other or a candidate trying to screw over the other, that we can actually listen to those communities and again, find how they would define representation while still protecting uh, populations. And I would just add, this is part of why it's so important from a process point of view to have these excruciating hours of group debates on different things because this is a very delicate area a lot of little subtle trade-offs, a lot of perceptions and fears, and this is one where you want the partisan Ds and the partisan Rs and the Is in the room, arguing, debating, listening, uh, because it's one of those areas where you can lose you can lose trust in the process. Hi, thank you all. Um, John Updike from Open Primaries. A question that I want to pose to you all. All of you in different ways have talked about the appetite in the country for shaking things up, for changing the system. And if you look at 2018, something like 16 ballot measures were on dealing with various political reforms and almost all of them passed by huge margins. And uh, Kent, you and Governor Schwarzenegger, both of you have addressed open primaries and redistricting reform. And in Missouri, you took on a whole slew of different issues. I wanted to ask how you all think about kind of capitalizing on this moment, not just to do one reform or, or this, but to really build a national movement that's taking on the whole political system and redoing it so the power resides with the people and not with the parties and the insiders. Like, how do you all think about that? Well, I believe that uh, we should do one step at a time. Uh, I think that we, for instance, tackled first uh, the redistricting reform and then second, open primaries. Uh, because one thing I learned very quickly, that in politics and in this whole arena, if you try to tackle too much, you lose everything. I've tried to do that in 2005 when we held a special election here in California and uh, we had four initiatives on that ballot and, uh, and uh, we lost everything because we just took on too much. Uh, so 
I think that we are in the right direction because you have to understand, this is a scam that has been going on for over 200 years. I think it started, what was it, 1812 or whatever it started, right? Uh, back in Massachusetts. And ever since then, they have been very busy drawing their own district lines and fixing the system. And it really has hurt the country. I mean, we could be performing so much better even though we are the number one country in the world, but we could be performing so much better if we would have redistricting reform and independent commissions all over the United States. So I think it's always, it's like a train. The beginning, you know, to get the train going and to move is always very, very difficult. It takes a lot of power. So we did that in California. California is known as kind of a, the kind of pioneer state, you know, where we start things and then the rest of the country pays attention to it and we get the notoriety, the spotlight is on it and all this stuff. If it's environmental issues or other reforms. Um, and I think that now we have a great momentum going because states have looked for the first time at California and said, well, they did it, so it must be possible. Before we lost and we lost and no one wanted to attempt it because it was impossible. But then we, we made it possible. And uh, so now I think other states see it, and the, you four states here saw it this way. And it was great to see that, that all of the states ended up winning. So I think this is a great message for the rest of the country, for other states to say, it's possible, we can do it. And uh, so I think that we should not put too much on the plate. I think if we can go systematically through and go from the one third to more than half of the districts to two thirds of the districts, slowly to go through it. I mean, you know, it has been around for so many years, so we are not in a rush rush. I just think there's a great opportunity with 2020 because there's so much chaos that now we can kind of wake up the people and say, look, if you don't like what's going on in Washington, let's go and do something about it and help other states. That's the idea. I would suggest that a convening like this is a really good place to start and um, because it's connecting people who are interested in the, in the same path forward. Um, but to the governor's point, we're talking about really big picture vision, but at the same time facing a time clock, right? Particularly on redistricting reform, because these, these maps are gonna get redrawn in 2021. So if we're talking about other states needing to uh, pursue similar measures, we gotta make that happen now, right? And so I call myself a realist idealist, which is like, I love to have big vision, big picture, let's get it all done, but at the same time you have to realize you have limited time and resources. Um, having said that, one of the things, again, about I think these conveniences are so, so um, wonderful for is if there's anybody out there in the audience who's thinking about pursuing redistricting form, there's a wealth of knowledge in this room. And I can assure you, I'm, I'm happy to talk to anybody and give them guidance. People did that for me, right? I couldn't have gotten a better boundaries to the place it was without a, an enormous support from people who had already done it. And, and that's what it's gonna take to move this forward, to tap into this energy that's been created in 28 because you're right, it's there, and we can't let it dissipate. Um, but it, talk, it means talking together, trying to um, support one another, and um, pursue registering form across the nation. Uh, so, I'm sorry. So that's all the time we have uh, for the panel today. And so if we could go ahead and have a round of applause for our panelists. I just I think it will be more than fear since you've been sitting here for an hour and asking us questions, <laughs> that we turn to you and ask you a question. All right. <laughs> because uh, you have become very passionate about the subject. Mm -hmm. So I would like to hear from you what made you become that passionate and then to write so eloquently about it. Well, I, so I write for Daily Coast, and I'll be very upfront. We are a partisan democratic organization, but, you know, First and foremost, we are committed to democracy with a small d. And so seeing this decade's redistricting cycle where gerrymandering has been more extreme than it has ever been in the last five decades of one person, one vote, it got me really interested in you know, how we could change the process. And so you know, I've done a lot of work drawing alternative maps and saying, you know, hey, what if we had this other set of criteria, what would the result be? And so, you know, redistricting isn't this problem that it's easy to solve. You know, it's not a simple math problem where there's an objective answer. It's, any, you know, any map involves trade-offs. And so as people have been saying on this panel today, you know, it's great to listen to diverse people 
and you know, people who have different backgrounds, different interests, and, and listen to them about what they think is a fair map. But for our organization, you know, we are committed to certain principles, uh, and one of the most important of which is you know, we want the party that wins the most votes to win the most seats. You know, it, that's a pretty standard criteria in a lot of other democracies that Americans don't have. But it can also conflict with other competing priorities, like ensuring people of color have adequate representation, or you know, preserving communities of interest. So again, you know, it is very important to have both parties and independents and people of very different backgrounds coming together and, and talking about what they think is a fair map. So. Congratulations. Let's give a big hand for that. And I would just say in the end, any other journalist that is out there, just write and articulate what redistricting reform is all about and why we need it. The more you write about it, the more we communicate, the more it's out there, the more people read about it, the better it is. Because this reminds me kind of like on my promotion of bodybuilding. When in the beginning no one knew what the hell it was, but we sat down and we had sessions like that where we talked about training and the benefits of weight training and resistance training and all of that stuff for other sports and for the rehab and blah, 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 and all this kind of stuff. And we started gaining momentum. And we did it all over the world. If it was in France, in Germany, in Japan, China, and everywhere, all over the world. And we did like thousands of those sessions. Thousands. And now there is no hotel where there is not a weight training room, a fitness room. Every military base has a weight training room. Every a, a, a fire station, every police station, every university, every high school, every athlete are using weight resistance training. So this is how popular it became. It became a huge industry. But it took four decades of talking and talking and talking and talking over and over and communicating and coming out with documentaries like Pumping Iron and st stuff like that. So uh, the same is with this. And the same is with the environmental issue, with global warming and to explain that to people and about pollution and why we have to go and reduce CO2 uh, and all that stuff. It's, 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 it's all about the more we talk about it and the more we make an effort, you know, it's, it's every one of us has the responsibility to be a team player because remember, the biggest movements in the history, if there's the anti-apartheid movement, um, if it is the independence movement in India, uh, the suffrage movement in America to give women the right to vote, the civil rights movement, all of this were people's movements. It was the power of the people. None of those problems were solved in any capital. They were all solved because people rose up and they let their voice be heard. And the same is with this. We just got to go and put the fire out on everybody and just, just get going and not the rest, because we should not watch television at night and be angry. Use this anger, let it out, and say, I'm gonna go and do something about it. That's why I talked at my speech about getting off the couch. You know, because there's so many people that sit on the couch and say, oh, I hate that Fox TV, they're always going with Trump, let me change over to CNN, and then they go and they complain about that. And they just complain and they scream, and I say, what do you do about it? What do you do about it? That's really the question. Is that you have the power to do something about it. And so this is what this is about. So we hope that each and every one of you walks away and says, what can I do about it? And then goes out and does something about it. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here today.